morning, Hope. My name is Heather Mandela, and I'm one of the pastors here, and we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us this morning. So a special welcome to you if you are joining us online. We do hope you'll say hello in that chat right there. And we are excited to celebrate the 4th of July weekend together. We hope that you are all having a safe, safe, wonderful time for the next few days. Will you join me as we open together in prayer? Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord God, we are so grateful. We are so grateful for all that you have given us. We are grateful because we recognize that there are places in this world where we can't sing your praises freely. We know there are places, Lord God, where people have to hide their worship, hide their faith in you. Lord God, we are grateful that that is not where we live. We are grateful for the freedoms we are granted here in this country. We are grateful for those who have worked to protect those freedoms. God, we also recognize that with great freedom comes great responsibility. Lord God, as Christ followers, you have called us to love others well. You have granted us freedom that we might be advocates for those who have no voice. You have given us freedom that we might love mercy and justice. You have granted us freedom that we might love those who live in pain. So God, we are so grateful for the freedoms that we, you give us, that this country affords us. But we do not forget the responsibilities that come with that freedom. We know, Lord God, that you have called us to be your light. And we are in a place where we are allowed to shine. So God, I ask that you would shine through us, that you would use us to make this a better place for all to live. That you would use us as your hands and feet to lift up the oppressed. That you would use us to advocate for justice. That you would use us to heal the broken. To lead those who don't know you. To love others the way you would love them. And we know, Lord, with your strength, with your courage, with your spirit in us, there is nothing, Lord. There is nothing that you can do. And we are so grateful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together. Can you please stand? Let's we'll sing this together. Christ in me, for I've been born again. My heart is free, the hope of heaven before me, the grave behind. Hallelujah, you brought me back to life.
you've done for me Jesus to fully praise you He will take all eternity Just like Lazarus
out of that pit. He did, he did. Who paid for all of our sins? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh. Take a seat. Your mic is not on. Would the family presenting their child for baptism come on up with me? Thank you. Hi, guys. How are you? Good, good. You guys can stand All right. behind me. Right, go ahead over there. There we go. Beautiful. <laughs> Baptism is an outward and visible sign of the faith that we have within us. It is a sacrament marking Christian disciples, initiating those into the fellowship of Christ's holy church. And there is a special place that our Lord has put aside for children because he loves them. And we know that because he said, let the little children come to me. And we are so excited here at Hope. Every time we get to welcome new children into the sacrament of baptism. So welcome family and thank you. I did meet with this family previously, and we talked about the questions they're going to be asked now. So I am going to ask you guys what we have talked through already, um, and we are going to be able to come together in that. Are you ready? All right. <laughs> She's ready. <laughs> yes, she is. All right, beloved, do you, in presenting this child for holy baptism, confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? If so, please say, I do. Do you therefore accept as your bounden duty and privilege to live before this child a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise godly care, that they be brought up in the Christian faith, that they be taught the holy scriptures, and that they learn to give reverent attendance upon the private and public worship of God? If so, please say, I do. I do. <laughs> Will you endeavor to keep this child under the guidance and ministry of the church until they, by the power of God, shall accept for themselves the gift of salvation and be confirmed as full and responsible members of Christ's holy church? If so, please say, I will. I will. Awesome. So Jesus said that through him come springs of living water. It's that water that cleanses us from all unrighteousness and makes us pure in the presence of a holy God and quenches our soul's deepest thirst. Jesus is the living water. All right, who we got here? Hi. <laughs> Come to me. Come here, sweetie. Look at you. How are you? That's a beautiful dress. 
This is your baby sister. Awesome. Is that your big sister? Yes. <laughs> yes, she has lots to say. <laughs> All right. And what name is to be given to this child? Elena Michaela. It's okay. Shh, 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 shh. Yeah. Elena Michaela, I baptize you in the name of the Father <laughs> and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And as you grow in wisdom and stature, may you love, grow in the love and knowledge of Jesus. Okay, yes. <laughs> done, you did it. You did it. You did it. All right, and how old is she? She's just over a year. Just over a year. I know, it gets better. Yeah. It really does. She was one on her birthday. She was. <laughs> and how old are you? Five. You're five? <laughs> oh, wow. And? That's awesome. Wow. That is awesome. So this is a, a time where we as a congregation uh, join with families to commit ourselves uh, to this most important task of raising children uh, in the faith. And so we take that seriously here at Hope, and we get to affirm that at these baptisms. Absolutely. So members of the household of faith, I commend to your love and care, Alina, whom we this day recognize as a member of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that she may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior, Jesus Christ? With, With our God's help, help, we will so order, order our, our lives after, after the, the example, example of Christ. Christ that Elena, Elena surrounded, surrounded by steadfast, steadfast love, may be established, established in the faith and confirmed, confirmed and strengthened in the, strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. eternal. Amen. Congratulations. Okay. Creator this morning, would you please stand and let's sing of just how great, how big our God is. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath. So we pour out our praise to you only. You give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You 
you for your love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Hello, Hope. If today is your first time, welcome. My name is Rick, and I'm one of the pastors here at Hope Church. And happy July 4th weekend. Now, whether you're worshiping online or in person, if you are a guest with us today, we are glad that you are choosing to join us. If you are newer and you haven't done so already, please go to the Today page and click the New to Hope button. We would love to help you get further connected to our community. Each of you can easily get to the Today page by using the QR code posted on the chair in front of you. Or if you're online, the chat host is putting it into the chat right now. At the Today page, this is where you can give your financial offering also. And if you're in person, there are giving stations in the lobby. As always, when you give online, you click on the Give button at the top of the Today page. We ask you to support this church financially because we know that lives are being changed and your financial gifts make a difference. You see, while other churches might slow down during the summer, at Hope, we are gearing up for a busy summer season. Vacation Bible School just finished on Friday. Our summer drama camp starts later in July, and a high school mission trip is leaving soon, and a middle school mission trip is leaving soon after that. Your generosity through the summer makes these things possible as we help people who feel far from God move closer to God. And now together in all of our places, let's watch this brief Vacation Bible School summary video. You guys stop your feet like that and let's clap together that's it keep it going let's sing this little light of mine it's the light of mine i'm gonna let it shine it's the light of mine i'm gonna let it shine it's the light of mine I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All right, keep clapping now. Sounds good. <laughs> Everywhere I go. Everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine. Yes. Everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine. Shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, that sounds so good. That's called clapping on the back beat. All right, sing this real quiet with me now. Even when I'm afraid, I'm gonna let it shine. Even when I'm afraid, I'm gonna let it shine. Yes, even when I'm afraid, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Yes, good stuff. It was very exciting here last week, I can tell you that, with uh, over 150 kids, uh, over 70 volunteers, and uh, they did an amazing job. 
One of the things they do each year for VBS is they raise money for a mission initiative. And uh, this year, I was touched to know that they had identified the Seeing Eye, which uh, trains and raises guide dogs uh, for visually impaired and blind people. And uh, so the proceeds went there. And those kids and their families contributed $3,600 that will go to the Seeing Eye. So just a word about that. Um, it costs about $70,000 to raise a seeing eye dog, to train and raise a seeing eye dog, $70,000. What they charge uh, those who are going uh, to get a dog, um, it costs me and my family $150 for those three weeks of training and to come home with uh, this amazing uh, support dog. And uh, if I go back after he retires, um, no time soon, buddy, don't get excited. Um, <laughs> but the next, any dog after the first one, it's $50. So all of the money is uh, contributed from donors uh, who have compassionate hearts. Um, and I am so grateful that this church uh, chose to make that contribution so somebody else will, uh, will have a guide dog uh, like I've had. Speaking of guide dogs, um, which is what I do a lot now, um, speaking of guide dogs, I've got a whole new set of things that tick me off. <laughs> right? Now, when you're walking around with a guide dog, um, it brings out um, some weird stuff in people, apparently. Um, now, the vast majority of people are great. When they see me walking with the dog, they get that, that this dog is guiding me, and so they're very respectful. They, they make way for us. Um, if they speak, they speak to me and not to the dog because they don't want to distract the dog. That's the vast majority of people. But there are those people referred to by people with guide dogs as dog people, Dog people who say, I know I'm not supposed to, you know, interrupt and I'm not supposed to talk to your dog or pet your dog, but I can't help it. I just have to put your dog in. <laughs> Which literally means, I don't care if this makes you unsafe, I need to pet a dog. <laughs> it's a little weird. Um, Marilyn and I were out for breakfast a few weeks ago. And uh, we were sitting outside uh, at this restaurant at a table, and uh, a guy comes out from the bakery that was there, and he's carrying his white bag with, I assume, baked goods in it, walks right up to my dog with this bag of baked goods and goes, would you like to eat this? Would you want, do you want to eat this food? Do you want these baked goods? And I'm like in stunned silence. Marilyn finally says, please stop doing that. And the guy goes, <laughs> jerks. So what ticks you off? <laughs> what kind of things make you angry? Is it, you know, the way people drive? Is it uh, a, an inept boss? Is it um, wait staff that uh, are rude to you when you go out to eat? Is it people who wear white after Labor Day? <laughs> who is it that ticks you off? Who is it? What are those things that make you angry? Now, all of us deal, as we go through the course of a day, with those irritants, those situations or those people that just frustrate and irritate us and make us, you know, a little angry. And so that's all the normal stuff of life. In fact, I'm that, I'm sure, to a bunch of people as well. You may be too. I'm more concerned about the level of anger that seems to be prevalent in our culture today. I'm sure you've noticed and you've been hearing about and witnessing over the course of several years now this kind of increased level of anger where people seem to be more angry and less filtered in what they say and how they say things to people with whom they disagree. And what I find the most discouraging as I've witnessed that is 
that church people, church people haven't acted or sounded any different than people in the culture who make no claim to faith whatsoever. Over the past several years, I've watched and heard people who claim to be following Christ mocking, attacking, and rejecting people who they disagree with. And when you confront somebody with that, who's doing that, they kind of hide under this banner of righteous indignation or tough love. In truth, what it really is is just rude, ignorant, and obnoxious behavior. And it saddens me. But I also recognize how easy it is to get sucked into it. Somebody says something to you or in earshot or writes something that you disagree with, and you respond maybe with a little edge in your response, which elicits a response back to you from them, which has more edge. And maybe there are other people either around or on this uh, social media thing that you're having this exchange with, and they weigh in, and it gets hotter and nastier and more obnoxious, and you're off to the races. This got me thinking. This kind of experience, this reality in our culture got me thinking. What ticks off Jesus? Right? What makes Jesus angry? And when Jesus is angry, how does he respond? So that's what we're going to be looking at over these next four weeks. So before I go there, I want to say a couple of things just about anger in, in general. Anger is not sin. Anger is not sin. Anger is like an internal alarm system that lets you know that some strong negative feeling has been awakened in you. It's this little alarm that goes, oh. And when you think about what is it that I'm feeling right now, what is bringing up this anger, it can be things as, as different as fear or frustration or confusion or injustice. The list goes on and on of things that can evoke a sense of anger within you. The Apostle Paul, in writing a letter to the church in Ephesus, and talking to them about anger, did not write, do not be angry. Instead, what he wrote was, in your anger, do not sin. Recognizing that anger is a natural thing. When you feel anger, do not use it as a pretext to sin. So getting angry is natural. It's this alarm system, like I said, to the circumstances or events going on around you. Anger is natural. What you do with your anger is a choice. How do you respond when you get angry? Now, you can choose to lash out verbally or physically when you become angry at whatever it is or whatever uh, situation or people or whatever it might be, you can lash out and do damage. Or you can use that energy, that anger that wells up in you, you can use that to affect positive change within yourself, within a relationship, or within the culture or society at large. Bruce Main, the founder of Urban Promise, a ministry that many of you are familiar with, we've been partnered with them for, for decades now, um, doing tremendous work in the city of Camden, and Urban Promise uh, has started affiliates around the country and in countries around the world. 
And so I asked Bruce Main, the founder, um, so how did a kid born in Canada who was going to the university, a university in California end up starting a ministry in Camden, New Jersey? And he said, oh, well, Tony Campolo, many of you are familiar with Tony and uh, who Tony is, but Tony was a professor of sociology at Eastern University and a nationally known speaker back in the uh, 80s and 90s. And he said, Tony came to our campus and he did a series of talks on um, uh, social things and, and how we as Christians can make a positive difference in our society. And he said it was so inspiring and so motivating and our whole campus was a buzz when, when Tony left. We were all just really jazzed by the things he said and motivated and so forth. But he said within a couple of days, all of that had dissipated and nothing changed. And he said it made me angry. And so I wrote a letter to Campolo and said, what the heck are you doing? Why, why do you even bother coming and getting people all stirred up and then nothing happens from it? And it started this little exchange with Tony, and finally Tony said, how about, why don't you spend your summer here in Camden, New Jersey, working with students here? And that was the beginning of Urban Promise. It started with a young man's anger who chose to use it in ways for good to honor Christ and other people. It's not a sin to be angry. It's what we do with sins, how we choose to use it, that matters. Now, on to Jesus. One of the things that clearly ticked Jesus off, and, and this series we're calling Anger Management, but I wanted to call it Things That Tick Off Jesus. <laughs> I got voted out, but I'm going to use it anyway, because <laughs> I got the mic. So what ticked off Jesus? One of the things that ticked off Jesus was when religious people prioritized religious practices over people, believing it made them holy. When religious people prioritized religious practices over people, believing that made them holy, that would get Jesus ticked off. A lot of examples of that, but um, one that I want to talk about this morning is found in Luke chapter 13. It is, um, takes place in a synagogue. Jesus is in a synagogue. It's the Sabbath, and he is teaching the scriptures. And in the congregation, there is a woman who is described as being bent over, being oppressed by a demonic spirit and something physically uh, that's going on in her body that has her literally bent over, and she's been in that state for 18 years. And Jesus, in the synagogue, spots her, and he calls her to come forward, and he lays hands on her, and he says, woman, you are free from your infirmity. And immediately she straightens up and begins to praise the Lord. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be sitting there on that Sabbath day watching this happen? Like, what must it have been like for that woman to have lived in pain? Can you imagine living in pain every day of your life for 18 years? Some of you don't have to imagine it. Some of you are probably living this. Every day of her life being in pain, uh, distorted physically because of what's going on in her, both spiritually and physically. And suddenly, in a moment, freed from that, it says she began to praise God. Of course she began to praise God, right? What else would you do? And then imagine being in that congregation and what it must have been like for the people sitting in that congregation. Imagine what it must have been like for her rabbi who was probably um, someone who she met with over the years and talked about and had prayers from and so forth. And Imagine what that rabbi, that leader of the temple must have felt. 
We don't have to imagine. Luke tells us that the temple leader, on seeing what happened, was indignant. He was indignant, ticked off, angry. Why? Because Jesus broke the rules. He broke the rules. And rather than rejoicing and praising God, this temple leader begins to recite the rule to Jesus. Because, you know, <laughs> he didn't know it. <laughs> Six days you shall work, and on the seventh day you shall rest. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. He was ticked. He was angry. This dude comes into my place and breaks the rules in front of God and everybody, and he thinks he's going to get away with Not on my watch. <laughs> there are rules. This is how Jesus responded. It's Luke chapter 13, 15 through 17. But the Lord replied, You Hypocrites, each of you works on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from its stall on the Sabbath and lead it out for water? This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage by Satan for 18 years. Isn't it right that she be released even on the Sabbath? This shamed his enemies, but all the people rejoiced at the wonderful things he did. The word of God for the people of God. As I read that, it struck me that Jesus didn't say hypocrite to the temple leader. He said hypocrites and talked to the whole congregation. And at first I thought, That's, why did he do that? And then I thought about, you know, being in that situation. And everybody, you know, kind of in that situation, being in the church, I've been in the church for a while, you know, and what I envisioned happening was this woman gets healed and everybody in the congregation goes, ah! but then the big mahaf comes up, right? I'm the big mahaf, right? <laughs> I'm like a big mahaf. And the big mahaf says, <clears throat> there are rules and he broke the rules. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Six days you work, seventh day you rest. He broke the rules. And everybody went, oh, yeah. That was oof, bad. Right? They were all in on it. Now, notice here that Jesus really what he broke was a rule he did not break the commandment the commandment of God right remember the Sabbath keep it holy don't work rest Sabbath was intended to be a time of restoration restoration of body Mind, spirit, relationship. That's what Sabbath was for. That's what God was interested in. But because human beings uh, like rules and we like 
to, you know, help God out with stuff. We decided, they decided, we need to help people understand what God meant. So they created rules around Sabbath about what it means to work and what it means to rest. And they had a series of rules around this commandment. Jesus didn't break the commandment. He was honoring God. He was honoring the Sabbath. He was keeping it. They were in the synagogue. He was teaching the word of God. But there was a rule that said, you don't heal, because that's, you know, work. And Jesus looked at them and said, you know, you guys, you're such hypocrites. I mean, if by your own rules, taking one of your cattle, untying it, walking it out for water because you care about that animal. You don't want it to suffer in the heat without having water. And so you break a rule in order to care for an animal, but for this woman who has been suffering for 18 years, you want to keep the rule and somehow blame me? No. Jesus walked right over Sabbath rules and never felt any obligation to apologize to anybody for that. You see, what we do with religion is we create rules to help God and then we become more committed to the rules that we've created than to the relationship we have with God. That's religion. That's what religion is about. And that's why I don't like to be known as religious. It ticks me off. <laughs> When people say, oh, well, you're religious. I'm really not, though. I have a relationship with Christ. Our faith is about a relationship with a living God in Christ. That's what it's about. Religion is about rules. Religion is about structures. And religion is about deciding who's in and who's out. The guy who got indignant with Jesus, what did he care about? The rules. He cared about the rules and lost sight of this amazing thing that God had done for a suffering human being. He's more interested in religious purity than about eliminating suffering. Religion cares more about defending its rules and its structures than about people. And that's why I don't like to be known as religious. So Jesus did this routinely. It was like a hobby for him, breaking Sabbath rules. He, he, he did it because he didn't care about those rules. He walked right over those rules because they didn't matter. One time when he did that, he had done another healing on a Sabbath, and he got attacked again. And Jesus said, you don't understand. God made the Sabbath for human beings to serve human beings. He didn't make it so human beings would serve the Sabbath. You've got it backwards. God made it for our good not to do us harm. So he walked right over those. And Sabbath wasn't the only rules that religion had created that Jesus ignored. There were times where uh, Jesus would hang out with tax collectors and other sinners. The rules say you don't do that. 
but Jesus cared more about the people than about the rules. Jesus celebrated Samaritans. The rules say you don't do that, but Jesus cared more about people than the rules. He treated women as equal. The rules say you don't do that, but Jesus cared more about people than about the rules. See, Jesus didn't come to reform Judaism. He didn't come to reform the Jewish religion. He came to create something brand new. The kingdom of God on earth, what he called his ecclesia. We reinterpret that to mean church, but it literally means a gathering. Jesus was creating a gathering of people to create not a religion, but a movement that transformed the world. But I know we still like rules, right? So Jesus said, all right, you like rules, let me give you the rules. Rule one, love the Lord with all you've got. Rule two, love your neighbor. That's the rules. Those are the rules. And sometimes that's harder, which is why we create religious institutions and so forth to create more rules that help, you know, we think help us and so forth. They end up getting in the way because it's hard. What does it look like to love God with all I've got? Give me the rules rather than the relationship. What's it mean to love my neighbor? Give me the rules rather than the relationship. But those are the rules that Jesus gave to his ecclesia. Love God with all you've got. Love your neighbor. You want structure? Here's the structure. We are all one body. Jesus is the head. There's the structure. So simple, so profound that it changed the world and can continue to change the world today. So you may love religion, you know, and maybe you're offended by the fact that I say I don't like to be called religious. Maybe you like religion. And for those who like religion, Jesus' brother, James, it really is half-brother, James, defined what a Jesus-honoring religion looks like. Ready for this? It's from the letter that James wrote. It's chapter 1, verse 27. This is what he said. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God, the Father, means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. That's religion. It's not just widows and orphans. It's those people. In, in that day, widows and orphans were among uh, the most distressed people around. They had the least ability to care for themselves. What's James saying? Care for those who are hurting and don't get sucked into the way of the world, the way of anger and personal destruction, tearing each other apart. Don't go the way of the world. Love God. Love your neighbor. That's the religion that God cares for. So, what ticked Jesus off? Religious people prioritizing religious rules or practices over people, believing it made them holy. If that ticks you off as well, seeing Christians prioritizing religious practices over people, recognize you're in good company. And what do you do about it? What can you do about it? Welcome people into Jesus' ecclesia. 
love them because Jesus does and we can still be a people that changes the world let's stand together for closing prayer So Lord, forgive us for those times when we get angry and use our anger to lash out at others and do damage to friendships, do damage to your church, do damage to our society. Lord, help us to use anger as a fuel to do right, right in your eyes. Lord, help us to love you well, to love our neighbors as ourselves so that our religion might be pure. We ask these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God's people agreed and said, amen. Hey, have a great 4th of July weekend, everybody.